Okay, so hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be starting a new chapter. That's chapter 32 of Giancoli. And the topic here is reflection and refraction of light. So we are jumping ahead quite a bit in the textbook. Um, the last chapter we did was 16 and now we're jumping ahead to chapter 32. But the topic is actually very closely related to what we've been talking about in the last couple of weeks, which is mechanical waves. Because it turns out light is just another type of wave. So we can use a lot of the sort of mathematics we've been building up over the last couple of weeks to describe light. And this is gonna be the first of many chapters which covers light. So over the next uh, month or so, we're gonna be talking about different aspects of light and exploring all of that. So let's get started. And the first thing we wanna do is just get a basic understanding of some of the characteristics of light waves. So what is light? Uh, what kind of wave are we talking about when we refer to light? We just want to get those basics down at the outset. Okay, so the starting point for us is going to be Maxwell's equations. Now, if you've taken physics 46, you'll have already seen these equations, uh, but maybe written in a slightly different form. If you haven't taken physics 46 or some equivalent course, then you may not have seen this before, and that's okay. Um, my goal is not really to get into the details of the equations. I just want to show you something you can do with the equations and how you can use them to understand what light is. So there are a set of four different equations. They're shown here. And again, let's not get into the mathematical details so much. Let's just try to understand what those equations are basically saying in a nutshell. So Maxwell's equations describe how electric charges and electric currents create electric and magnetic fields. Okay, that's really what it is. If you have an electric charge, so something like a proton with a positive charge or an electron with a negative charge, or if you have electric currents like uh, moving charges, let's say electrons that are going through a wire in a household appliance, that kind of thing, then that will create electric and magnetic fields. So an electric field is given by the variable E and a magnetic field is given by the variable B. So these equations just relate those two things. And in those equations, you're gonna find a couple constants. Um, one of those constants is this one, which we call mu naught. This is the actual value of that. Um, the other is epsilon naught. So the value is given here. Okay, so if you take those equations and then you say, I want to th think about a region of space where there are no electric charges and there are no electric currents, so basically just a completely empty region of space. Well, the way we would do that is we would set rho equal to zero. That tells us there are no electric charges. So this term will set to zero. We'll also set J equal to zero. That tells us there are no electric currents. And then if we just focus on one dimension, let's just say the X direction, okay? The equations can be reduced to this. So we're gonna have the second derivative of E with respect to time is equal to one divided by mu naught times epsilon naught times the second derivative of E with respect to X. Then we'll also have an equation that says the second derivative of B with respect to time is equal to one divided by mu naught times epsilon naught times the second derivative of B with respect to X. Okay, so hopefully these two equations look familiar in just the basic form. Each one of these is called a wave equation. These equations describe a wave consisting of, in the first case, an oscillating electric field, and in the second case, an oscillating magnetic field. And it's moving at some speed. Remember, in the wave equation, V squared is the term that goes right here in front of the second derivative with respect to X. So in other words, one divided by mu naught times epsilon naught 
It's just the speed squared. So if we want to know the speed of this wave, we'll take the square root of that. So we call this uh, speed C. That's the speed of the wave. And if you actually plug in those two constants that I gave you earlier into that uh, equation, what you get is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay, so this is actually a really big deal. This is a really huge result in the history of physics because at the time of Maxwell, it was known that light moves at a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So basically what Maxwell has done here is he showed us that light is just what we call an electromagnetic wave. It's a wave that consists of oscillating electric fields and oscillating magnetic fields, and it moves at exactly the same speed that we know light actually moves with. So for a very long time in the history of physics, um, people have wondered about the nature of light. Uh, what is light made out of? What is light? And James Clerk Maxwell gave us a pretty good answer to that question. In 1864, um, Maxwell used the equations that I showed you on the previous slide to prove that light is an electromagnetic wave. And again, what that means is it's a wave consisting of an oscillating E field and an oscillating B field, so an electric and a magnetic field, which are both oscillating in some way. Now, there are a few things that we, we would wonder about as far as you know this electromagnetic wave. The first would be, what is the source of the wave? Every wave has some kind of source that emits the wave. In the case of light, that source would be some kind of oscillating charged particle. So for example, if I had an electron over here that was bouncing up and down like this, it would be sending out an electromagnetic wave. And in general, all light that you see around you at some level is created by an oscillating charged particle, by charged particles jiggling around. Okay, the other thing we would worry about is what is the medium? Because let's say we're dealing with a wave on a string. Uh, well, the medium obviously would be the string. If we were talking about sound moving through the air, the medium would be the air. Now, when it comes to light, it turns out you don't actually need a physical medium for light to travel through because light can travel through perfectly empty space. I mean, just think about this. We're receiving light from the sun all the time, and that light is traveling through pretty much empty space in order to get to us. So that's just, again, showing you that light doesn't need any kind of physical medium to travel through. It can travel through perfectly empty space. So it's a little bit different than other waves we've seen in that respect. So light waves, it turns out, are transverse. Remember, we have longitudinal waves and transverse waves. Light waves are transverse because the electric field E and the magnetic field B are oscillating perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So let's take a look at what this uh, actually looks like in an animation. So in blue, we have the electric field and you can see that it's oscillating up and down along the Y axis. In red, we have uh, the magnetic field B, which is oscillating along the Z axis. And then the wave itself is moving along the x-axis. So this would be a transverse wave because, again, the wave is oscillating perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Now, what do we know about the speed of light? Well, in a vacuum, in perfectly empty space, the speed of light is given by c, which is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now, it's important to note for later that light waves will travel at slightly different speeds in different materials. So if you have light traveling through water or through glass, then the speed is going to be a little bit different. Okay, so since light is a type of wave, we can talk about the wavelength and the frequency of light. And the electromagnetic spectrum, the EM spectrum, is just a way of sort of classifying all the different possible wavelengths of light. 
So if we take a look at this diagram here, on the very left side, we have the smallest wavelengths. And on the right side, we have the largest wavelengths. So very small wavelengths are classified as gamma rays. So something like 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the minus 12 meters in wavelength. That would be what we call a gamma ray. Then we have X-rays in ultraviolet rays. And then in this tiny little section of the electromagnetic spectrum, this is the light we can actually see with our eyes. So it doesn't actually cover a very big range in terms of wavelength. It's about four times 10 to the minus seven meters to about eight times 10 to the minus seven meters, roughly in that range. Then as we increase the wavelength past that, then we have what's called infrared rays, then radar. And all of this over here is radio waves. So we have FM radio, uh, what you would dial in on your car stereo as an FM station would have wavelengths around here. Uh, actually TV signals that are broadcast uh, through the air also have a certain wavelength. And then AM radio has the longest wavelength. So those are just different ways of classifying electromagnetic waves in terms of the wavelength. And again, it's really important to see that what we can actually see with our eyes is just a tiny little sliver of the overall spectrum. So we can only see a very limited range of wavelengths. Now, the fundamental relationship between speed, wavelength, and frequency is still going to hold for light. So it's still true that V is equal to lambda F when it comes to light waves. Okay, so let's do a little bit of a calculation using that idea. So the human eye can detect light with wavelengths in the range of about 380 nanometers to 740 nanometers. The question is, what range of frequencies in Hertz does this correspond to? So we know the range of uh, wavelengths that we can see. What is the corresponding range of frequencies that we can see? And so as part of your calculation, you're gonna use the fact that in a vacuum, the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So pause the video, try to work this out, and then uh, come back to it when you think you have your answer. Okay, so V is equal to lambda F is where we'll start. This is the fundamental relationship between speed, wavelength, and frequency of a wave. And it applies to any wave, including light, so we can use it to solve for frequency. F is equal to V over lambda. Now, in terms of the range of wavelengths that we can see, the smallest is about 380 nanometers. So nano, by the way, is a prefix that means 10 to the minus nine or one billionth, so one nanometer it's 10 to the minus nine meters. Okay, so we can calculate the corresponding frequency, uh, which is gonna be V 3.0, 10 to the eight meters per second, divided by lambda, which is 380, 10 to the minus nine meters. And we can then cancel out meters. We're just left unit wise with inverse seconds, one over seconds. And we get 7.9, 10 to the 14 inverse seconds, which is the same as 7.9, 10 to the 14 Hertz. Because remember one inverse second is the same as one Hertz. Okay, so this type of light looks kind of bluish or violet. That's the smallest wavelength and highest frequency light that we can see. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, where lambda is 740 nanometers, that's the um, largest wavelength uh, that our eyes can pick up. In this case, F would be V, which is 3.0, 10 to the eight meters per second, divided by 
740 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. Units are the same as before. We get inverse seconds, which is the same as hertz. So now we get 4.1 10 to the 14 hertz. This light, by the way, the largest wavelength and smallest frequency light that we can see, um, corresponds to red. Okay? So what is the range of frequencies we can see? Range of visible frequencies. Well, F is anywhere between 4.1 10 to the 14 hertz and 7.9 10 to the 14 hertz. So it's a pretty narrow range of uh, frequencies, but these frequencies are absolutely gigantic. Think about this. 4 times 10 to the 14. That's about 400 trillion. So if the frequency is about 400 trillion hertz, that means the light, the light wave is oscillating up and down 400 trillion times every second. So very large frequencies. Okay, so that brings us to light rays. Now, if you think back to chapter 15, we developed a couple different tools that we can use to visualize how a wave travels in three dimensions. And these are called wavefronts and rays. So just to review, a wavefront is a collection of points on a wave that are oscillating in unison. So usually when we draw a wavefront on a diagram, this represents the crest of a wave or the peak of a wave. So as an example, let's say this red line here is one of our wavefronts. That means every single point on this line is in phase with every other point. In other words, they're all hitting the peak of the wave at the same time. And similarly, if we have a wavefront over here, all of these points are in phase with each other and they're all hitting a peak at the same time. Now, the distance between two wavefronts is just the distance between two peaks of the wave. So that would be lambda. That would be the wavelength lambda. Okay, so let's say that the source of our light is a point that's just emitting light in all directions um, in three dimensions. So the wavefronts, therefore, are going to look like spherical surfaces that surround the point source. Remember, when you have uh, wavefronts in three dimensions, they have the shape of a sphere, spherical surfaces surrounding uh, the point source. Now, a light ray shows the direction that your wave is traveling in. So a light ray would be pointing in the direction of travel or the direction of propagation of our wave. So those are shown as little arrows, in this case, uh, in blue. Now, rays are always gonna be perpendicular to your wavefronts. So if we have a wavefront here, the ray that goes through the wavefront is always gonna be at a right angle to that wavefront. Okay, now this is generally what it looks like when you have a point source of light and those light waves are spreading out in three dimensions. But what happens if we get really, really far away from the source? In other words, if we call r the distance away from the source and lambda the wavelength, what happens if r is much, much bigger than lambda? So we're getting far away from the source. Well, notice how um, these wavefronts, these spherical wavefronts, are getting bigger and bigger as we move out, which means their curvature is less and less noticeable. Once you get really, really far away from the source, these wavefronts start to straighten out, and now they look like, instead of spheres, they just look like flat planes. And these are what we call plane wavefronts. This is what you get as long as you're very far away from the source. So the wavefronts have the shape of a plane. The light rays are going uh, perpendicular to those planes, and they're all just pointing basically in the same direction. Now, 
Rays in general are gonna be useful for all sorts of optical effects. So for example, the first one we're gonna talk about is reflection. We wanna know how is it that a light wave can reflect off of a surface like a mirror. We're gonna be using light rays as our tool to visualize how that happens. Okay, so that takes us to light rays at an interface. The idea here is when you have a light wave which hits the interface between two different materials, a couple different things can happen. So here's the basic picture. We have two different materials. Let's say down here we have water, and then up here we have air, just as an example. So the interface between the two materials is just the boundary that separates the air from the water. Okay, so on top of this line here we have air, Below it, we have water, so this would be the interface between the two materials. So let's say we have some incoming light rays. These are what we call the incident light rays. So what can happen to those light rays after they hit the interface between the two materials? Well, one possibility is transmission. So transmission just means the light wave simply passes through into the new material. So if this incident ray simply passes through into the new material, that would be called transmission. On the other hand, we have absorption. If the energy of that light wave is transferred to the new material in the form of internal energy, that's called absorption. So in this case, we have an incident ray hitting the interface, passing through, but then that light wave just gets absorbed by the material and Basically, that just heats the material up, okay? It adds internal energy to the material. The other possibility is reflection. So in this case, um, the light wave comes in and then just bounces off the interface and returns back into the material which it originated from. So it actually doesn't even go into the new material. It just bounces off the interface. That's reflection. So in general, um, some combination of these things is going to be happening. Um, in other words, some of the incident wave is gonna be transmitted, some of it is gonna be absorbed, and some of it is gonna be reflected. Some combination of these things generally will happen. And if you're near a window right now, you can probably notice this. When you look through a window, mostly light is being transmitted through the window because you can see what's outside but you can also see some reflected light uh, usually when you look at a window. So again, that just shows us that some combination of these things is happening at the same time. So with that said, let's take a closer look at reflection of light. And the law of reflection explains exactly how this works. And it's a pretty simple statement. When light reflects off of a surface, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So what does that mean? Well, when we talk about these two angles, the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection, we have to remember that the angles are going to be measured with respect to the normal line. So if this is the surface that our light is reflecting off of, the normal line is perpendicular to that surface. And so if we have an incident ray coming in, which goes and hits the surface, we measure the angle of incidence with respect to the normal line. So this is what we call theta i, the angle of incidence. And then the reflected ray, which goes out like this, again, we measure the angle that that is moving at with respect to the normal line. This would be theta r, the angle of reflection. So the law of reflection simply states that theta i, the angle of incidence, is equal to the angle of reflection. Pretty much that simple. Okay, the, the last thing to note about this, the last detail, is that the incident ray, the reflected ray, and this normal line, they all lie in the same plane, which is what we're showing here. They all lie in the same plane, which in this case is just the plane of the page. All right, so with that said, now that you know the law of reflection, uh, let's do an example. 
So here we have two plane mirrors, one here, one here, which intersect with each other at an angle of 62.5 degrees. So the angle between the two mirrors is shown here as 62.5 degrees. The question is, at what angle theta should an incident light ray hit the first mirror? So what, what should this angle theta be? So that it reflects off the first mirror and then it reflects off the second mirror and then the outgoing light ray is going completely horizontally. So try to work this out, pause the video, see if you can get it, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so we'll start by labeling some of the different angles that appear in the diagram. So the first one we'll look at is up here. This is the angle between the second mirror and the outgoing ray. And that's actually 62.5 degrees because what we're talking about as far as that angle goes is the angle between a horizontal line and the second mirror. Well, we actually know what that angle is because if we look at the bottom of the diagram, uh, the angle between the second mirror and the first mirror, which is horizontal, is 62.5 degrees. So we're talking about the same angle here. The next one I'll label is this one. It's the angle between the outgoing ray and the normal line to that second mirror. And for now, I'll just call that alpha. The one next to that, let's label that as beta. And then the one next to that, how about we call this gamma? Okay, now we work our way down the diagram over here. Let's call this, I don't know, delta, lowercase delta. And then let's call this one um, epsilon, how about? Okay, so I've labeled all of these unknown angles. Um, and what we're gonna do is work each one of them out. We're gonna start here at the 62.5 degree angle on the diagram and we're gonna work our way around until we figure out what theta is. That's where we'll end, okay? And each step along the way is just using a different fact about geometry or how reflection works. So, Okay, the first thing I can note is that 62.5 degrees plus alpha is equal to 90 degrees because, of course, when you add alpha to 62.5 degrees, you're just getting the normal line here, which, uh, again, makes a 90 degree angle with respect to the mirror. So alpha is just 90 um, minus 62.5 degrees, which is... 27.5 degrees. Okay, next. What's beta? Well, alpha and beta are the same thing. So beta is uh, 27.5 degrees. And the, the reason we know this is the law of reflection. The angle of incidence, beta, has to equal the angle of reflection, alpha. Okay, that's just the law of reflection. Okay, next, if we want to know what gamma is, we can use the fact that beta plus gamma is equal to 90 degrees because when you add those two together, you get a right angle. In other words, you get to the normal line, which makes a right angle with respect to the mirror. So gamma is 90 minus beta or 90 minus 27.5 degrees, which is 62.5 degrees. Okay, so the next thing we can note is that we have a triangle um, where the angles are gamma, delta, and also um, 62.5 degrees. So I'm talking about this triangle right here. And when you add the angles uh, inside of a triangle, we should get 180. So this is just using the fact that the sum of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. 
So what we can do with that is solve for delta. Delta is 180 minus 62.5 degrees minus gamma, or 180 minus 62.5 degrees minus 62.5 degrees again. So delta is, if you work this out, 55 degrees. Okay. So the next thing we can note is that epsilon plus delta, so the sum of these two angles here, well, that's going to be 90 degrees again because when we add both of them together, we just get the normal line, which makes a 90 degree angle with respect to the mirror. So epsilon, therefore, is 90 degrees minus delta or 90 degrees minus 55 degrees, which is 35 degrees. Okay, so the last step is to realize that theta, the angle we're trying to find, is just equal to epsilon, which is equal to 35 degrees. And how do we know that? It's the law of reflection once again. So the angle of incidence, theta, has to equal the angle of reflection, epsilon. Since we know what epsilon is, we know theta. It's 35 degrees. Get a bit more into the details here. There are actually two different types of reflection that we need to know about, and we need to know the difference between them. So this is what we call diffuse reflection and specular reflection. So here's the idea behind specular reflection. So let's say we have a surface here. This could be like a mirror, for example. And we have a bunch of incoming rays. These are what we call the incident rays. And all of the incident rays are parallel to each other, starting off. Okay, they all reflect off of the surface. If they reflect and they're all reflected in the same direction, in other words, they're still parallel to each other, after reflection, that's what we call specular reflection. On the other hand, let's say we have a bunch of incoming rays that are parallel to one another. So these are the incident rays. But then after reflecting off of a surface, they're scattered in many different directions. So they're just randomly scattered in different directions rather than all going out parallel as we had before. So that would be called diffuse reflection. And the reason this happens is not because there's a different physical law for this type of reflection and this type of reflection. In fact, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. It still applies at each point on the surface. It's just that in the case of diffuse reflection, the surface has defects. In other words, it's not perfectly smooth. So let's take a closer look. This is the point where the red ray hits the surface. So the normal line would be shown here. And the angle of incidence would be the angle between the incident ray in the normal line. The angle of reflection is the angle between the reflected ray and the normal line. Again, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. That still holds true at that point. If we look at this purple ray, so the incoming ray uh, hits the surface here, but you see, now the normal line is different because the surface is not perfectly flat. Now the normal line is facing this way. But again, it's still true that angle of incidence equals angle of reflection at that point, but that results in the outgoing ray going in a different direction than this outgoing ray. And the same thing goes for this green one. So again, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. But because the surface has defects, that means the outgoing ray is going over here. And then if we look at this blue ray, again, it's the same idea. Angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. But that results in a different direction for the outgoing ray. Okay, so in a nutshell, that's how diffuse and specular reflection both work. So to go into a little bit more depth on that, Let's talk about a specular reflector. 
this would be a very smooth surface without a lot of defects that uh, when light hits it, you get specular reflection. So for example, a mirror would be a good example of that or the surface of a lake on a very calm day when there aren't a lot of waves and ripples in the lake, that would be a pretty smooth surface. So when you get reflection of light off the lake, you get specular reflection. So in that case, the reflector is gonna produce an image of whatever emitted light towards it. So what we see on the right side here is a mountain in the background now, as light is emitted from the mountain and hits the lake and then gets reflected off of it, an image of the mountain is produced. You can actually see that uh, reflected straight off the lake. And of course, if you look in a mirror, you see a very clear image of yourself in the mirror. That wouldn't be the case if you're just standing in front of, let's say, a wall. You know, you don't see an image of yourself in the wall. So there's something kind of different going on there. When we have a diffuse reflector, that scatters the incoming light in random directions, and so it doesn't produce an image of whatever emitted the light towards it. So that's one key difference. For a specular reflector, it creates an image. A diffuse reflector, it doesn't do that. So you can actually notice this in the picture I showed you, because of course you don't see an image of the mountains in the trees, do you? Okay, that's because you get diffuse reflection in that case. So in general, if light hits a surface, we're going to have some kind of combination of these two different effects. We're going to have diffuse and specular reflection. How much of each type depends on the surface, but in general, you're going to have some kind of combination of those two things. So here's a good example of that. We have a ball and it's kind of shiny, so maybe it's been polished a little bit. Um, so if we look at, let's say, this part of the ball here, there's very clearly some reflected light um, that you can see, but it's diffuse because it's not producing an image of anything in particular, right? It's just randomly scattered light. It just looks like a blob of blue here. On the other hand, if we look at this point, that's specular reflection going on because you can see a somewhat uh, blurry image of the light source that's actually emitting the light towards the ball. So again, here we have the combination of specular reflection and diffuse reflection, and that's generally what's gonna happen. So that's really all I wanted to say about reflection of light. So now let's talk about refraction of light. So this is an effect that you've probably noticed at some point in your life. Um, when you're sitting at the table at a restaurant waiting for the food to come, and you have a glass of water with a straw in it, you may notice this sort of thing happening where the straw appears to sort of be broken or disconnected um, when you look at it through the water. Now, that's just an optical illusion, of course, and the reason for that is refraction of light. The reason it looks like this is because of this effect called refraction of light. So let's get into it. Okay, so refraction of light waves. What is this all about? Well, refraction refers to a sudden change in the direction that a wave is propagating in as it passes from one medium into another. Okay, so let's say we have two different materials, maybe up here, uh, this is air, and then you know down here, this could be water, just two different materials. And so if light uh, travels into the water, that's going to be a light wave passing from one medium into another, okay? So the idea behind refraction is, as soon as the light wave passes into the new medium, its direction is gonna change. The direction it's moving in is going to change. So this line here represents the ray. This is the direction the wave is moving in. And then uh, perpendicular to that, we have the wave fronts. So you can see in the picture, the, the incoming ray is moving in a different direction as the ray that gets transmitted. And so this bending of the light ray, this change in direction of the light ray is what we call refraction. Now, why this is actually happening comes down to the fact that the wave will change speed 
as it goes from one medium to another. So light can travel at different speeds depending on the medium. And if the speed sun suddenly changes as you go from one medium to another, that's actually the reason for refraction. And we'll get into that in all the details in a second. But one really important number that's always gonna pop up in our equations is something called the index of refraction of the material. So this is given by N. N is equal to C divided by V. So C is the speed of light in a vacuum. We've already seen what that is. That's three times 10 to the eight meters per second. V is the speed of light in the material. So we just take the ratio of those two, we just get a number. And that number basically tells you how much is light being slowed down by the material. So in a vacuum, N is exactly equal to one because the speed of light doesn't change. So that's just a ratio equal to one. In air, the speed of light is barely changed. So N is very, very close to one. For all intents and purposes, we can treat the index of refraction as one when it comes to air. In water, it's 1.33, meaning uh, light is pretty significantly slowed down when it's traveling through water. And we have a whole bunch of other different materials shown in this table here. Each material has its own value of n. Okay. And so this is what it looks like uh, when we have a refracted ray. So the incoming light wave comes in this way. Again, wave fronts are perpendicular to that light ray. And the light ray gets bent as soon as it goes into the new material. That's the sort of thing we're talking about. Okay, so before we go any further with this, um, let's do a sample calculation. Um, the index of refraction of liquid water is 1.333. How fast in meters per second do light waves travel through liquid water? The index of refraction of solid ice, on the other hand, is 1.309. Same question, how fast in meters per second do light waves travel through solid ice? So in order to do the calculation, we need to know that the speed of light in a vacuum is equal to 2.998, 10 to the eight meters per second to give you a little bit more of a precise number. So we're gonna use the formula N is equal to C over V to make these calculations. So I left a link at the bottom of the slide to a video, which does a really nice job of explaining why light slows down in different materials like water and you can watch that on your own time if you want to learn more about that. Um, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail in this lecture as to why light slows down moving through different materials. To really understand that properly, um, you need to use equations from electricity and magnetism that you may not have seen before. So I'm not going to get into those details. But again, if you're interested, click the link at the bottom of the slide and learn more about that. So at this point, just pause the video, see if you can make these calculations, and um, we'll see what you get. Okay, so we have N, the index of refraction is equal to C, the speed of light in a vacuum, divided by V, which is the speed of light in the material. So V is equal to C over N. So in the case of liquid water, here's what we're dealing with. Light moves through liquid water at a speed equal to C, which is 2.998. What was that? 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by N, which is 1.333. So if you do the calculation, this works out to 2.249, um, 10 to the 8 meters per second. When it comes to solid ice, V is equal to C, which is 2.998, 10 to the eight meters per second divided by, now the index of refraction is a little bit less, 1.309. So this is 2.290, 10 to the eight meters per second. Okay, so that's pretty simple. So we've already seen that the speed of a wave can change 
as you go from one material to another. But what about the wavelength and the frequency? How do those change as you move from one medium to another? Let's try to get an understanding of that. And the example we're gonna use is a wave on a string because this is a lot easier to visualize than a light wave. So to show that we have two different materials, two different mediums, let's say we have two different segments of rope that have different densities. So here we have a rope segment with a linear mass density mu one. And then over here we have a rope with a linear mass density mu two. And the density mu one is bigger than mu two. So these two segments of rope are gonna be connected. So we have some kind of point of attachment here shown in green. And this is the boundary between those two different materials. Okay, so the first thing to notice is that in order for these two segments to actually remain connected at that boundary, any kind of wave that travels through the rope and goes across the boundary, it has to be continuous across that boundary. Here's what we mean. So this is the boundary. If we look at a point a little bit to the left of there on segment number one, that has to have the same exact displacement as a point on the rope over here on segment number two, just to the right of the boundary. Because if they don't have the same exact displacement, they can't actually be connected, right? So if, if this part of the rope is being displaced up here somewhere, and this part of the rope is being displaced down here somewhere, then they're not connected. It's really that simple. So you have to have the wave be continuous across the boundary, okay? So because the wave has to be continuous across the boundary, that actually means the frequency must remain the same, okay? In other words, however fast the rope is shaking up and down just to the left of that point of attachment is the same as the frequency that the rope is shaking up and down with just to the right of that point of attachment. Again, if you have two different frequencies on either side of the boundary, there's no way the rope can be connected, okay? If they have two different frequencies, there's no sense in which they're connected. So the frequency must remain the same across the boundary. So here's what we know so far. F1 is equal to F2. The frequencies are the same. But V2 is bigger than V1, so the, the speed of the wave over here is actually bigger. Uh, on the second rope segment because it has a smaller density. Also, we know V is equal to lambda F, right? So think about this. If F stays the same, but V increases, well, that means lambda is gonna have to increase as well. So in other words, lambda two is gonna be bigger than lambda one. That is the wavelength has changed as a result of this change in medium. So that's how it works for a wave on a rope, okay? As you cross from one medium into another, the frequency stays the same, but the wavelength changes. That's also gonna be true for light. If light travels from one medium into another, the frequency is gonna stay the same while the wavelength changes, okay? So keeping that in mind, let's do a practice problem. Let's say we have a beam of blue light, which has a wavelength of 485 nanometers when traveling through the air. What is the frequency of the light when it's traveling through the air? And we'll measure that in Hertz. Now suppose this beam enters a glass window. What is the wavelength and the frequency of the light when it's traveling through the glass? So, we have a table here with a bunch of different values of index of refraction for different materials. You're gonna look up window glass, of course. And the speed of light in a vacuum, you're gonna to need to know this. That's 2.998, 10 to the eight meters per second. So pause the video, see if you can work this out, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so how about we start with this? N is equal to C divided by V. That's the formula for the index of refraction. 
If we rearrange that, we can write v is equal to c divided by n. But we also know that the speed of a wave v is lambda times f, right? So in this case, if we want to solve for f, the frequency, we can do that by taking c divided by n times lambda. Okay? So in this case, um, if we're in air, n is basically equal to 1. It's really close to 1, and um, we can approximate it as 1, in which case we'll get f is equal to c, which is 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by n, which is 1, and 485 nanometers is lambda, so that'd be 485 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. So here's what you get. 6.181, 10 to the 14. And we cancel out meters here, and the units are inverse seconds, which is the same as 6.18, 10 to the 14 hertz. So that's the frequency of this light wave in air. Okay, what about in glass? Well, in glass, the n value that we take from the table is 1.52. And here's what we get. Well, the first thing to realize is that the frequency is unchanged. So whatever the frequency was moving through air, we have the same exact frequency moving through the glass, which is f equals 6.18, 10 to the 14 hertz. But what does change is the wavelength. And to see how it changes, we can actually use the same equation from before, which says f is c divided by n times lambda. If we solve for lambda, we're going to get lambda is equal to c divided by n times f. Where in this case, well, we have c equals 2.998, 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by n. Now we better be using n equals 1.52. And f is the same as before, 6.181 times 10 to the 14 inverse seconds. So inverse seconds cancels out. We're just left with meters. Lambda is equal to 3.191, 10 to the minus 7 meters, if you do that calculation. Which, by the way, we can write this as 319.1 times 10 to the minus 9 meters, just by moving the decimal place over twice. Now, remember, 10 to the minus 9 is nano. So what we can say is this is 319, rounded to three sig figs, nanometers. So that's the wavelength of the light when traveling through the glass. So the wavelength has changed. It's actually, um, wavelength has decreased. That's what we found. Okay, so next we're going to do a derivation. And the situation is something like this. We have two different materials, and let's call this line here, the interface between the two materials. So on top of that line, we have, let's say, material 1 with index of refraction n1. And then below that line, we have material 2 with index of refraction n2. OK, so let's show the normal line 
to that interface, like so. And let's show a ray that's coming in, uh, starting from material one. Okay, so here's the ray that comes in. Let's call this the incident ray. And the ray that goes through material two, it's called the refracted ray. And remember that's going to be bent. So these two rays are moving in two different directions. We can uh, specify that by giving an angle. So let's call this theta one up here. Okay, that's the direction the incident ray is traveling in relative to the normal line. And then this is theta two down here for the refracted ray. So what we want to do is relate theta one and theta two, okay? That's really the goal of this derivation. Okay. So that's the setup. Now, suppose that between these two materials, let's say N2 is bigger than N1, okay? Just so we have something to work with, let's say N2 is bigger than N1. And we'll also remember that N is equal to C over V, which implies that V is equal to C over N. And also remember the speed of a wave, as always, is equal to lambda times F. So if we take the equality between those two terms, C over N is equal to lambda times F, what we can get is F, or sorry, uh, is lambda equals C over N times F. Okay, so C is just a constant. That's the speed of light in a vacuum. F1 is equal to F2. Remember, the frequency is unchanged uh, when you move into a new medium. But again, N2 is bigger than N1. So since lambda is inversely proportional to N, as we see here, if N is bigger in material two, then lambda is gonna be smaller in material two. In other words, lambda two is gonna be less than lambda one. Okay, so in other words, the wavelength decreases, uh, decreases when moving to a material with smaller n. So one thing I can do then is I can draw wave fronts um, on my diagram and show that the spacing between the wave fronts is getting smaller when I go into material number two. So let's actually do that. Um, so yeah, let's draw a couple wave fronts. Um, first, let's draw one, let's say right here. Remember wave fronts are always uh, perpendicular to the propagation of the wave. Let's draw another one over here, how about? Let's do another one over here, let's say. And I think that's good. So we have a couple different wave fronts, right? So lambda one would be this distance right here. It'd be the distance between wave fronts when we're in material number one. So when we go into material number two, we have to show somehow that the wave fronts are getting closer together because the, wave, the wavelength again is decreasing, as we said. So here's how that's gonna have to work. In order for the wavelength to get smaller, the only way for this to work is if the wave fronts themselves bend when they go into material number two. So if they all uniformly bend as soon as they pass into material number two, we can actually see that the wavelength decreases. So let's label lambda number two here. And you can just see visually that it's a smaller wavelength, right? Okay, now 
we have a couple different triangles that we can construct from this picture. The first one is right here. So you see how we have a right angle between the wave front, which here, let me label this. These are the wave fronts. So we have a right angle between the wave front and the ray right there. We also notice that this angle is theta one. It's the same as the angle theta one we indicated earlier. And let's also note that uh, we have some kind of distance here in the horizontal direction. Let's call this A, okay? Now we have another triangle, which is inside of material two. Um, and here's how we're gonna construct that one. So again, I have a right angle uh, between the ray and the wavefront. Theta two is this angle over here. And this distance is the same as the distance A we indicated earlier. Okay, and so we have these two triangles. We can relate what's going on uh, in each one of them. So let's do that. Let's copy down the first triangle um, just in case it's getting a little busy on the original diagram. We have side length A, um, going horizontally like this. We have the right angle on top, and then we have theta one on the right side like this. And also remember that this side length right here, that's just lambda one, that's the wavelength lambda one. Okay, so that's the first triangle. Now the second triangle we have, uh, which looks like this, so there's a right angle on the bottom. There's a side length A on the top of it. Now, this, oops, this side right here is actually lambda two. Okay, that's the wavelength in the second material. And then this angle over here is theta two. So those are the two right triangles that we constructed from the diagram. Okay, so the rest of the derivation is just gonna be based on these two right triangles that we've uh, constructed here. Okay, so the first thing I can say is sine of theta one should be the opposite over the hypotenuse in the first triangle that I drew. So that would be lambda one divided by A, which gives us A is equal to, if we solve for a, lambda one over sine theta one. So that's what we can get by looking at the first triangle. By looking at the second triangle, we could say sine of theta two is equal to lambda two, that's the opposite side, divided by a, that's the hypotenuse. So in a similar way, we can solve for a. We could say a is equal to lambda two divided by sine theta two. Well, here's the thing about A. A is equal to A, right? My first expression for A is lambda one divided by sine theta one. That's equal to the second expression, which is lambda two divided by sine theta two, okay? Now, let's remember from scrolling up to here, lambda is equal to C divided by N times F. So let's sub in lambda is equal to C divided by N times F. So for lambda one, we have C divided by N one times F. So the frequency is the same for one and two, so I'm just gonna label it as F. And then we have sine theta one. On the other side, for lambda two, I have C divided by N two times F times sine theta two. So we're gonna cancel out C on both sides, cancel out F on both sides. And we have one over 
n1 sine theta 1 equals 1 over n2 sine theta 2. And if we just invert both sides, we get n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. This is exactly what we were looking for. This is the relationship between the angle of the incoming ray, that's theta 1, and the angle of the refracted ray, theta 2. The only thing we really need is the index of refraction, n1 and n2. So this is called Snell's law. Okay, this is the law of refraction. This is how refraction works. So this is the result that we derived. It's called Snell's law, and it relates the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction when light goes from one material into another material. So the setup is we have two materials. One of them, let's call this material one on top. This is material two on the bottom. The interface between the two materials, again, is just the boundary between them. So the incident ray would be the one that's coming in towards that interface. And of course, that's going to make some angle theta one with respect to the normal line. So we measure all the angles off of that normal line, which again is perpendicular to the interface. Okay, then the ray that goes into the second material is going to be refracted. It's going to be bent by some amount. And so it's going to make a different angle with respect to the normal line, which we'll call theta 2. So the relationship between those two angles is given by n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. It's a pretty simple relationship at the end of the day. So let's get a little bit of practice uh, using that equation. And let's do this example. Jerry, a swimmer in a pool, this is Jerry down here, shines a flashlight up towards the surface of the water at an angle of 37.5 degrees relative to the normal line. So the ray of light he's sending out is at 37.5 degrees relative to this normal line. What is the angle of the refracted ray entering the air? So what's this angle right here? And as a follow-up, to someone observing this from the air, so let's say someone is over here uh, observing this light, does Jerry appear to be closer to or further away from the surface than he actually is? So pause the video, see if you can work this out, and then we'll go through it together. Okay. So we're going to be using Snell's law to make the calculation. n1 times sine theta 1 equals n2 times sine theta 2. And it doesn't really matter which material we label as 1 and which one we label as 2. So how about we just say the water is going to be material number 1 and the air is going to be material number 2, which means n1 is the index of refraction of water, which is 1.33, and uh, theta 1 is 37.5 degrees. Uh, that's the angle of the incident ray in the water. So again, this is for in the water. Now N2 is air. So it's approximately equal to 1, very close to 1. Let's just treat it as 1. And theta 2 is something we don't know. We would like to uh, figure out what that is. So this would be for in air. All right, so our work is cut out for us. Um, I guess the first thing we do if we're trying to find uh, theta 2 is to say sine of theta 2 is equal to n1 divided by n2 times sine of theta 1. And at this point, we can plug in some numbers. n1 is 1.33, n2 is 1, and sine of theta 1 is sine of 37.5 degrees. So this is something that we can compute. Um, 1.33 times sine of 37.5 degrees is 0 0.9, sorry, 0 0.9. 8097. And so if we want to solve for theta 2, we have to take the inverse sine of that. 
So if sine of theta 2 is equal to this, then theta 2 is equal to the inverse sine of 0 0.8097, which, if you compute this, comes out to 54.07 degrees, which to three sig figs is 54.1 degrees. So this refracted ray is coming out of the water at an angle of 54.1 degrees. So the second question is, from the perspective of this person, okay, let's say the person uh, who's not in the water, the person who's in the air, um, does the swimmer appear to be closer or further away from the surface than he actually is? So to figure out what this means, how about we take the ray that's going into the person's eye and trace it back behind the water. So from the perspective of this person uh, who's looking into the water, it looks like that ray is actually coming from up here because if we trace it back, um, that's where it would be originating from. In other words, the swimmer is actually down here, of course, but the swimmer appears to be up here. In other words, the swimmer appears to be closer to the surface of the water than he actually is. So the swimmer looks like he is closer to the surface than he actually is. And if you've ever spent a lot of time in a pool, kind of observing the different optical effects that can happen when you look into the water, you may have noticed this kind of thing before. Okay, so that's it for this video. Um, we're gonna continue on with this chapter and wrap everything up in the next one. And then I think in the next one, we'll have some time for some uh, practice problems. All right, so I'll see you then. And until then, uh, take care, be healthy out there. See you later.